Hi, this is Matt Baker. On this channel, we usually use charts to talk about history, but today I'm going to do something different. Today I'm going to talk about science and about one of the most famous charts of all time, the periodic table. Throughout your life, there's probably been many times that you've seen a periodic table hanging on the wall of some classroom. Sometimes the colors or fonts are different, but generally speaking, the shape is always the same. It is always shaped like this. Well, have you ever wondered why it's shaped this way? I mean, why are the elements not simply shown like this? Well, over the years, there have actually been many attempts to come up with new and more interesting ways to display the periodic table several of which, in my opinion, look much nicer than the original. But everyone always seems to fall back on this one. Why is that? Well, today I'm going to explain to you the meaning behind the shape of the periodic table. But I'm also going to try to convince you that the general public could perhaps benefit from looking at an alternative periodic table. This one is the one that we sell on our website, usefulcharts.com. It makes the hidden pattern behind the periodic table more clear. Let me show you how. Everything in our universe is made up of atoms. And atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons have a positive electric charge and are located in the center of the atom, whereas electrons have a negative charge and travel around the center. Neutrons, as you might have guessed, are neutral, but we won't be talking much about them in this video. They're located in the middle with the protons. An atom with a specific number of protons is called an element. So, for example, an atom with six protons is an element called carbon, whereas an atom with eight protons is a different element called oxygen. When an element is in its common or neutral state, the number of electrons will match the number of protons. So, at the most basic level, a periodic table is simply a list of elements in order of their number of protons and electrons. So, element one, hydrogen, has one proton and one electron. Element two, helium, has two protons and two electrons. Element three, lithium, has three protons and three electrons, and so forth. If this was all that the periodic table did, it could indeed be given a very simple shape. We could just list all the elements in order, in perhaps groups of 10 or 20. But the periodic table tells us much more than just the number of protons and electrons per element. It gives us further details about the electrons. You see, electrons travel around the center of the atom in a very specific way. First of all, there are shells. The first shell can hold only two electrons, whereas the second shell can hold eight. Initially, the third shell also holds only eight. But then the next shell holds 18. We then get 18 again before it jumps to 32 and 32. So we have a pattern that looks like this. 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32, 32. Try to remember that because it's going to show up again. Let's now bring up the standard periodic table. Note that it can be divided into rows and columns. The rows are called periods, which is where we get the term periodic table. The columns are called groups. And here's something else that's really important. The two rows at the bottom are actually supposed to fit in here, in periods six and seven, which means that really the periodic table should look like this. But that would require a really long piece of paper. So what most chart companies do is simply place these two really long sections at the bottom as kind of a footnote. But I want you to keep in mind that all of those elements at the bottom actually belong in rows six and seven. So here's the thing. If you add up the total number of elements in each row of the periodic table, you wind up with the following totals. Two, eight, eight, 18, 18, 32, and 32. 
Aha! Looks familiar, right? That's the same pattern we found when it came to how electrons start filling up the various electron shells. But there's more! Each shell can have up to four subshells. These four subshells are called S, P, D, and F, and can hold 2, 6, 10, and 14 electrons, respectively. Note that 8 equals 2 plus 6, 18 equals 2 plus 6 plus 10, and 32 equals 2 plus 6 plus 10 plus 14. I'll give you a second to let this deeper pattern sink in. Now here's the fun part. Let's add the periodic table back. If you look closely, you'll notice that its odd shape is due to the fact that it has four main blocks. There's this tall section over here, which I've shown in red, that is only two elements wide, which matches the number of electrons in the S subshell. It is usually missing a piece at the bottom, but on some periodic tables, you'll notice that element number two is moved over in order to fill in the hole. On the far right, there's a large block, which I've shown in blue, that is six elements wide, which matches the number of electrons in the P subshell. Then there's this long block in the middle, which I've shown in green, that is 10 elements wide, which matches the number of electrons in the D subshell. Finally, remember that footnote at the bottom, shown here in yellow? Well, if you count the number of elements in those rows, you'll note that, surprise, surprise, they come to 14, which, of course, is the number of electrons in the F subshell. So altogether, the widths of the four blocks are 2, 6, 10, and 14. So once again, we get a pattern that matches how electrons fit into their shells. And just like the four subshells are called S, P, D, and F, the four corresponding blocks on the periodic table are also called S, P, D, and F. But why then does the periodic table not look like this? Well, not only does each shell and subshell hold a different amount of electrons, the way in which they fill up also follows a very distinct pattern. It's called the Modelong Rule, and let me show you how it works. I'm going to add electrons to the atom diagram on the left, and at the same time, I'm going to also add elements to the periodic table on the right. So we start with shell 1, subshell S. After that comes shell 2, subshell S. Next, shell 2, subshell P. Then we get 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D, 4P, 5S, 4D, 5P, 6S, 4F, 5D, 6P, 7S, 5F, 6D, and 7P. So we now have the answer to our question. The reason why the periodic table is shaped the way that it is has to do with how electrons fit into their shells and subshells. But here's the thing. This incredible and quite orderly pattern isn't immediately noticeable when you look at the periodic table. It's there if you know that it's there, but to be honest, it's kind of hidden. Most people don't even know about it, and it took me quite a while to explain it to you. But what if the periodic table was redesigned so that the electron pattern was more visibly noticeable? Well, that's what we've done with our alternative periodic table. Our table starts at the top and has a new line for each subshell. The result is a vertical format that both looks nice and clearly shows the pattern of how the various electron shells get filled in. So here's what the poster version looks like. The most notable feature is the four colors, 
which represent the four blocks or subshells. The color scheme is the same as what I've been using throughout this video. So red is S, blue is P, green is D, and yellow is F. Note that the seven distinct periods of the periodic table stand out really nicely on this version, and you can clearly see that they get larger as you go down. The groups are also easy to find. Basically, all the elements that are in the same position in each period belong to the same group. So for example, the red element on the left in each period is group one, also known as the alkali metals, whereas the final blue element in each period is group 18, also known as the noble gases. If we zoom in, we can see that there's lots of other information listed. For each element, you have its name, number, and symbol, as well as its atomic weight and electron arrangement. Note that man-made elements are shown shaded, and the state of matter at standard temperature and pressure is indicated by a symbol next to the name. So for example, the white square next to iodine means that it is a non-metallic solid, whereas the circle next to xenon means that it is a gas. Now, you might have wondered why some of the symbols for the elements don't seem to match nicely with their names. Like, why is silver AG instead of maybe SL? Well, in ancient times, only 12 elements were known and named. Therefore, in most cases, the symbols for these elements are based on their old Latin names as opposed to their new ones. So, for example, Fe is based on ferrum, which is the Latin name for iron. Now, before I go, let me point out that I'm not saying that this alternative periodic table is better than the traditional one. For chemists or anyone who does serious chemistry work, the traditional table will always be the best. This is because the traditional table is designed to make it easy to find out which elements can be bound together to form compounds. However, most of us are not chemists, but we still might be interested in how the universe works and in what the patterns are behind how atoms are formed. For the everyday person, I think this alternative periodic table better displays these patterns in a way that is more immediately apparent and thus, at a single glance, captures one of the beautiful structures that exists at the heart of our universe. Like I said, if you want to get a copy of the chart as a poster, you can head over to our website, usefulcharts.com. Thanks for watching.